Welcome to Our Highest Work, a podcast where we are gathering and sharing the very best ideas for spiritually based business success and where we are creating a community of wise and loving mutual help. My name is George Cow, and I'm particularly excited about today's episode because we are starting a series on the topic of virtuous marketing. Now, uh, when I first planned this episode, I used the, the term authentic marketing, and um, after doing some Googling on that, I realized that you know there are some who, who um, I respect about who write about authentic marketing, but then there are so many people who use that term authentic marketing that um, anyway, in my in my opinion, in my high standard, uh, isn't isn't as authentic as I'd like it to be. So uh, when I when I searched the term virtuous marketing, there was very little about that, and so I really want to set a higher standard for marketing, uh, not in terms of how flashy or how you know brilliantly designed things are. I'll leave that to you know Apple and, and other uh, companies who have big budgets. But I want to set a standard for marketing that is um, truly uh, as aligned with our divine source as possible, as aligned with virtue as possible. So let me start with today's, this episode's quote. And this quote is a little bit long, but I thought it was very um, telling, and uh, uh, here, here it goes. Every day, bright and shiny new products are thrust upon us shrink-wrapped in striking colors, boldly proclaiming their dominance and necessity. They jump off billboards with bright white smiles and beautiful skin. They're stocked with attitude, emotion, and catchy slogans. Diamonds are forever. Just do it. Have it your way. They tickle our ears and grab our attention. This is the modern world. But the human experience wasn't always this way and our unquestioned commoditization of all that we interact with has striking implications for the things that can't be bought and sold. Greed, envy, sloth, pride, and gluttony, these are not just vices anymore. No, these are marketing tools. And this quote was from a beautiful essay by uh, John Foreman. He's a member of the rock band Switchfoot. And after this recording, I'll put the link to that uh, essay uh, in our show notes. Uh, I encourage you to go and check that out. All right, so um, today we're going to be talking about virtuous marketing. Why are we doing this? Because knowing, because this podcast is about doing our highest work, and part of our highest work is our true livelihood, doing the work that we were meant to be doing, um, work that uh, fulfills us emotion in our hearts emotionally, that grows us spiritually and sustains us physically. To do that work, it's not enough just to do that work. Um, well, it, it, it sometimes is enough just to do the work and then hope you get noticed. Oftentimes, though, that takes a lifetime or even after one's life, which is why many artists become famous after they die, because there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot many more years and hundreds of years after they die to be, to be discovered. So if you want to do your true livelihood in your lifetime, in this lifetime, um, it's extremely helpful to know marketing. But knowing marketing isn't enough because doing the marketing that most people, uh, most companies, most businesses are doing, even most solopreneurs are doing, in my opinion, it can be detrimental to one's conscience, even to one's health, right? But that's detrimental to one's conscience and one's sense of alignment with the truest, the highest uh, source of self. And I, I believe that our connection with our divine source is the most important thing, the most important thing, and that our business and our marketing is really... Um, is part of the uh, stage on which we we grow and act out um, our ex our soul's expression and and learn how to connect more and more closely and consistently with our with our divine source. So 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 on the one hand, without marketing, you won't have a business. You'll have a you have a, an unpaid hobby. And on the other hand, uh, um, 
marketing can lead you down a path that you regret uh, in, in your soul. And so we are looking for a higher way. And the higher way I'm proposing to call virtuous marketing. It's marketing that actually focuses you on true service. And that actually brings your true ideal audience to you. So uh, before going on, I invite you to comment on this episode. Uh, if you are watching this episode, um, you might as well be taking notes so that you can make good use of this time. And if you take notes, you might as well share it with this community so that uh, I can benefit from knowing what's really resonating with you, that you can benefit because when you take notes, it you know kind of uh, reinforces what you learn and allows you to look back and look at the notes afterwards. And it benefits the others who are looking at this video to see if it's worth it, now uh, if it's worth watching. Now, if you're just listening to this and you want to find our comments page, you want to find our video page, you can go to ourhighestwork.com slash 15. And I really do welcome you to write down whatever you want to remember on our comments page. I always really appreciate knowing that you're there, um, that you're benefiting from this. And just to take a quick look at the comments page, I already see comments from uh, Barbara Freeman and Marilyn Taylor. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, on the comments page and, and for today's um, episode. All right, so um, let me go on to the content then and let me first define, share with you my current definition of what virtuous marketing is. Now I invite you to listen to this definition and let me know what your thoughts are about what virtuous marketing is. My definition I'm sure can be improved so I look forward to your comments. So here it is. Virtuous marketing is improving the match and visibility between what your ideal audience wants and what you provide and doing it as honestly and transparently as you can. It involves niching, referability, and scalable generosity. And I'll be talking about these things, of course, today. Most importantly, Virtuous marketing is about truth and service, consciously avoiding what is inauthentic and untrue and strengthening constantly your virtues in your marketing and outreach. So I know that's kind of a long definition, but that's what I've got for you now. And uh, the, the key again, what I, what I said in the beginning was improving the match and visibility of what, between what your ideal audience wants and what you provide. So, so, um, so let's talk about this. So first of all, I've defined virtuous marketing, and I think definitions are often useful when we talk about what it is not. So virtuous marketing is not what so much marketing is out there, which is subtly or obviously deceptive. Much of it is subtly, so subtly deceptive that you don't even know it. Uh, one of my pet peeves. I know so, this is something that probably some of you use, and uh, I'm not, you know, I'm a, a kind of, I'm a bit of a, I'm a perfectionist nowadays in terms of ethics and spirituality, but not in terms of my business. I make all kinds of mistakes in my business, but and all kinds of mistakes in my, you know, speaking and writing all that. I'm not a perfectionist there, but I'm 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 trying to be a perfectionist. I'm trying to be a purist when it comes to ethics and, and virtues because I think we can, and I think we can always try to do better, right? So. So one of my pet peeves is psychological pricing, $29.99, $19.97, $47, dollars That's They are tricking you, plain and simple. There's you know, some spiritual marketers will say, well, there's a meta, it's a spiritual number, and seven and fives, nines are spiritual numbers. and So we use them because it connects with the, with the customer's divine self. Baloney! Go to Wikipedia, look up psychological pricing. That's what they're doing. They're using, they're using numbers to trick you, $9.99, 9 $9.99, oh, that sounds nice. They charm you into realize, thinking that it's a lower price than, than it actually is. Because if it's $10 or if it was $2,000 instead of $1,997, $1, if it was a round number, you would then be able to more consciously, more intuitively look at whether that's right for your budget. I don't believe that as marketers, we are meant to be getting people to spend as much money with us as possible. I, I hate the term lifetime customer value because we're looking at our customers as people who spend money rather than as human beings and souls for, for whom our service can genuinely help. Again, it's all about framing, but framing and words 
actually shapes our consciousness and how we relate to other people. So let's stop talking about lifetime customer value and let's talk about lifetime true service, right? Um, so anyway, there's tons of deceptive things happening in marketing that you probably don't even realize you're being deceived by. And I'll try to surface those things as I, as I think about them. But it's, so virtuous marketing is consciously avoiding deception, manipulation, false personalization. False personalization is, dear Barbara, if I'm writing an email to 16, my 16,000 email subscribers, I'm not going to say, dear Barbara, because I want you to know that this is a mass email. Now, I know all the savvy marketers say, well, but if you say, dear Barbara, dear Marilyn, oh, they're going to feel better, and they're going to feel like you're talking to them. They're going to feel like you're being a friend. But I'm not. I'm, I'm sending a message to my list. If you look at all of my emails, the ones I send now to my, to my whole list of 16,000, I send about between one to, to three a month, maybe one to four a month per month. So about one a week or usually less than one a week. Notice in those emails, I don't say, Dear John, Dear Barbara, Dear Marilyn. I don't use that first name tag. In fact, I don't even ask for first names when in my email opt-in pages. I don't do it, and I haven't done it for five years, and yet I built a very successful business. You don't need to do stuff like that. You don't. Stop listening to marketers who say you have to use their first name. You have to do psychological pricing. Baloney. You don't. I'm living proof, and many other people are living proof that you don't have to do much of the marketing that's out there to have a successful business, a true livelihood. So that's what I'm here to model and uh, hopefully inspire you to, 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 to do. So anyway, virtuous marketing is not about deception, manipulation, false person. I even heard a conscious business coach say that, well, manipulation is inevitable. We have to manipulate people into doing what we want them to do, uh, whether it's in having them buy something or having them do something after they buy it. No, but, and he says, he says, we just have to manipulate them with the right reasons. Baloney, you'd never have to mani manipulate people, never. You, what, what the problem in marketing is, is that we think people have to be manipulated. No, they don't. They have to be given clarity so that they can make a decision by their own free will. And sometimes that decision is not to do business with you. But you need, to, you need to help them get clarity on what is the right choice for them, as pure as you can, because guess what? Sometimes they'll buy from you, sometimes they won't. Maybe most of the times they won't. Maybe you'll be referring them to a competitor or a niche mate. But what happens is you build true loyalty. You build true loyalty in the person you're talking with, and also even you build true loyalty in your competitors and niche mates, knowing that you're referring people to the right people. Okay, and what happens with true loyalty is you'll never want for business. It takes some time to build true loyalty, and we'll be, we'll be talking about that, but it doesn't take as much time as you might think. Okay, so, um, okay, virtuous marketing is also not about tricking audiences into doing something. So much email marketing is about that. Oh, tr tricky headline. Ooh, it made me open it. You know, or ooh, it made me click on this link, and oh, I get I get disappointed because I just realized I got tricked into clicking a link or opening an email. Forget all that. Be honest and straightforward with people. You know, um, it's also not about interruption. So much of advertising, in fact, is interruption. You know, I'm I'm looking at a website, and why are there banners on the sides? interrupting me when I'm trying to read something. They're thinking, well, maybe we'll just subconsciously manipulate you into clicking this. I don't do that stuff, and, it, and I don't have to, and you don't have to either, okay? So, um, all right. <laughs> enough, a bit of, enough of a soapbox. Uh, I hope this is inspiring for you in some way. Um, but let me go on to what virtuous marketing is. And by the way, um, uh, thank you also to Bob for joining joining me, and I think I saw Marilyn. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I mentioned Marilyn before. I think I saw Mary also in, in here. So let's go on to the three stages of virtuous marketing, okay? And what I'm going to say, you know, the three stages, much of it will resonate as simply good marketing advice because virtuous marketing is good marketing advice stripped of the bad ethics, okay, and strengthening in the virtues. So it's marketing that works, and it happens to be aligned with what I, I believe God or divine source is calling us to. Um, uh, so stage one, 
So think of these three stages as, as I, I love the spiral analogy because I, I feel like that's really what human development is. We are spiraling. We start not knowing much. We learn more. We love more. We, we are more courageous. We are more loving. And we spiral larger and larger to heaven. So think of these three stages of virtuous marketing as a spiral out. But you're always coming back. You're always actually coming back to these three stages. But you're doing it in a wiser and more loving and more courageous and more effective way. So the three stages are offer strength, the strength of your offer. That's number one. Number two is referral relationships. And number three is customer happiness. Okay? Offer strength, referral relationships. And customer happiness. And, so, and as I mentioned, if you're watching this video and therefore on the episode comments page, I invite you to comment uh, as you learn things. And I, I love to, to know that. And actually, I'll tell you that there is a stage zero. <laughs> so technically, there are four stages. I like to say one, two, three. And then zero is, is optional, but it's helpful. And it, it's something that I like to do. Stage zero is what I call. Um, scalable generosity or, or infinite generosity. And so let me talk a little bit about each one and then I'll delve more deeply into this, the first stage today and, um, and then in the next couple episodes I'll, I'll, I'll finish it off. So um, the, um, I'll, I'll, let me, I guess I'll start with stage zero because that's zero is before one. And stage zero which I call infinite, so the, the number zero, infinite generosity, the number zero represents free, free, because when you are infinitely generous, you don't charge people anything, okay? Now, again, this is not a business yet, okay? You, when you're in stage zero, that's why it's called stage zero, because it's not yet a business. Stage one, when you have an offer, when it's strong, then you start to have a business, but zero, stage zero is infinite generosity, zero stands for free, and also when you divide by zero, you get infinity, so I, I love that symbolism. Infinite generosity or scalable generosity is where you uh, educate your market. It's where you educate the world about your passion, about your true livelihood. You educate them on the content of your expertise for free. And let me share with you where I recommend doing this. Okay, so there is, you could do it through video on YouTube, just like this is a video on YouTube. Um, you could do it. So when you when you post videos to YouTube, it doesn't cost you any money, and it doesn't cost any money for the watcher, your audience members, to watch it. It's free on both ends, and therefore it is scalably generous or infinitely generous because it doesn't matter if one person watches your YouTube video or 10 million people watch your YouTube video. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs Google something. It doesn't, it, but for you, it's scalably generous. And actually for Google, Google's happy because then they might watch advertisements on YouTube and that makes Google money, right? So it's infinitely generous is putting YouTube videos on YouTube. And one way of doing that is by doing um, two to four minute tip videos. So whatever you're good at, whatever you're passionate about, think about recording two to four minute tips on YouTube. But that's much more likely. And do as many of them as you can, dozens or hundreds eventually and have the title of the video be the question itself that someone might type into Google to, or YouTube to find the answer to that question. That's probably the best thing. I'm working up to that because I, I have <laughs> practiced for five years giving lectures and giving workshops. So I typically talk for 30 to 90 minutes at a time. So, so I realize now that it's going to be much more effective for me to do two to four minutes. Again, two to four minutes. Okay even between one and a half minute to four minutes, but less than four minutes, ideally. Okay? These podcasts are 30 to 60 minutes, as you know, and that's because I'm, I'm still working up to doing very, very short ones. I'm going to keep doing these podcasts still for in-depth teaching. But anyway, YouTube is a great place. Um, if you, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to in the show notes for my suggestions on how to get started quickly and easily with, with YouTube. Um, Great place to do it because you connect with your audiences and you also naturally have audio that you can then download the audio from YouTube. You can well you, you download the video from YouTube, you convert it to audio in iTunes uh, for free again, and then you can upload it to a podcast uh, a podcast um, hosting website. And the podcast hosting website that I use is libsyn.com 
dot, dot com, L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. I'll put it in the show in the comments page as well afterwards. And that's for, for five to twenty dollars a month. So it does cost you, the content creator, if you want to do audio content for the world, it does cost you five to twenty dollars a month, depending on how much how much content you upload. Okay? And that's I use Libsyn.com for that. For text, if you are a writer, which I know many of you are, uh, what I recommend is using medium.com. Medium, as in not, not too long, not too short, but medium, medium.com. That's where I put my blog as well. The key thing about writing at, on Medium is that once you've written something, you need to submit them to as many collections that are relevant as possible. Without submitting them to collections, your, your writing won't be discovered on Medium. So you have to, and the reason I suggest Medium is because once you've submitted your writing to several, to as many collections as you can that are relevant and, and, and they approve, then your writing starts getting picked up by Google. Google loves Medium.com. Medium.com was, co was founded by the person who co-founded Twitter and who co-founded Blogger. So huge, very successful writing websites that um, now he's founded Medium, which is sort of, uh, not a book, not a tweet, but somewhere in the middle, an essay type of uh, length. Okay, so infinite generosity. Um, I, will, uh, I will put a link in the comments page for uh, a mind map I have about how to make content more engaging. So you can look for that later. And um, the reason why I call step stage zero stage zero is because if you don't go to stage one, if you are forever just blogging for free or uploading YouTube videos or doing podcasts, but you never make a, 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 an offer that's truly a match for your audience, if you never make offers like that and you never make your offers visible, you won't ever have a business. You'll just have a hobby, right? That's why it's called stage zero. And unfortunately, so many people get stuck at stage zero, they say, oh, just one more awesome blog post I write, then I'll start thinking about my offer. Oh, just one more great video, or just one more podcast episode. So remember, don't get stuck at stage zero, because you don't have a business, you have a hobby. Go to stage one, okay? And remember, it's a spiral, so it's not linear, it's not like this, it's not stage zero, one, two, three, and then you're done for life. It's stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, spiraling upward and upward to your true livelihood. Okay? So, uh, let me now go to stage one. Stage one is what I call offer strength, which is the strength of your offer. Now, <laughs> so many people think, Oh, I've got a, I've, I've got my service. I've been doing it for a while, maybe, and I just need more visibility. I just need more people to know about my service. I need to know how to talk about it so that um, so that people will hire me or buy my service. Okay. Actually, I have discovered after years of coaching that usually, usually, it's not a marketing problem. It's not a visibility or outreach or even enrollment problem. It's an offer problem. The offer, the program, the service that one has is not strong enough. It's not really enough of a match for what the market wants. If you solve the offer problem, and, and by the way, again, it's not solved. It's getting better with every spiral. The, more be the, the better you get at your offer, the less outreach you need to do because it is so good that people will spread the word for you because it's truly a match for the market. If you had the cure to cancer, you don't have to market it very much. People will, trust me, will spread the word for you. If you have something that can, um, you know, make a marriage, you know, really awesome without years and years of therapy, and people experience that, they will spread it for you. If you have something that, you know, helps people make money in, a, in an authentic way without years and years and years of effort, trust me, they will spread it for you, okay? If you have a, a, a foolproof way to connect with God, <laughs> I'm being facetious because I don't, you know, I think that's to be, that's dangerous, but let's say you had a foolproof way to connect with God and it doesn't take 50 years of, of meditation or prayer or whatever, trust me, people will take, people will spread the word far and wide. That's why some spiritual teachers are Huge, because they just, people go, oh my God, I, I feel my divine connection when I'm listening to the spiritual teacher or whatever. Or do it. You know what I mean? 
It's the offer. It's not the visibility or the enrollment or the outreach or the joint ventures or whatever. It's the thing is not yet good enough. And so let me talk about how to make the thing better. And and just to bolster my argument here, I was listening to a uh, an, an, an interview with the founder of thinktraffic.com. He's a traffic marketing and traffic you know what website traffic expert. And when he was asked, what is the number one Tell me, if you could tell me the most important things about getting traffic to my website, what would you say? And I was delighted that what he said. He said this, number one thing about getting traffic to your website is creating something people want. <laughs> creating something people want, he said was number one. Number two is, and then, dif and then clarifying with your audience how it's differentiated from the other things that are available out there. For solving the same problem or reaching the same goal or dream, okay, um, and and uh, by by creating something people want and clarifying how it's whom it's better for, it's not that your thing is better for every better than everything out there. It's your thing is better for some people in certain circumstances. Okay, we all can occupy a niche. If you try to occupy the the whole niche in the whole world. First of all, you're going to have a lot of competitors. People are going to say, well, you do, you do what? You do everything? Well, I, I do this, and you do that too. You don't do everything. Okay? You don't help people with everything, even though you're you think your methodology can help people with everything. Every, occupy your niche and be content and humble and, and wealthy with occupying your niche, right? Or having, the, having enough money, plenty, more than enough money, more than enough clients. Occupy your niche because then you become a specialist. You become really good at serving that type of person in that type of circumstance. And then people will refer you like crazy to other people like that in, in that type of circumstance. Okay? And then he, he went on to say, okay, create something people want, clarify how it's differentiated with other things out there, and then create relationships with hosts of other audiences so that you can bring your, your free message or your offer to other audiences. Things like guest blogging, interviewing, being on podcasts, you know, and creating genuine friendships with those hosts, so that they're friends, they're people, they they want you to succeed, of course, as friends. Right? So that, that's what he said, right? I'm like, that's what I would have said too, in a different way. So, um, so do you have something that's filling a need? Okay, have you asked people about it? Have you? How many people have you asked about your thing? Hey, would you buy this thing? Ask as many people as you can. Would you buy this thing that I'm having? And I'm not trying to sell you. I'm just asking you because I'm trying to do a marketing research here to whether people really want to buy this thing and who who would want to buy this thing. Do you know anyone who would want to buy this thing that I'm offering here? And if not, what would you change about this thing so that you would want to buy it or someone you know would want to buy it? What, what would you change about my service? I'm offering a spiritual healing uh, service. Well, then they say, well, I don't. Well, what do you mean spiritual healing? I don't know what that means. Oh, oh, what I mean is that I use um, Reiki to help people heal. Um, I, I actually don't know anything about Reiki. But I'm just using that as an example. I use Reiki to help people heal um, their um, chronic pain. Would, would, would you buy that? Oh, they'll say, well, what do you mean by chronic pain? That's really broad. Oh, uh, specifically, I've helped people heal their chronic fibromyalgia. It's like, oh, okay, all right, yeah, I actually know a friend who has fibromyalgia. You should talk to her to see if they, she would buy it. Not, you know, don't try to sell her, but ask her. Great, would you mind contacting her? And I'll tr I promise I won't try to sell her. I'm just trying to do some market research. You talk to her, and she says, well, yeah, but what, tell me your credentials. or why, why should I trust you on this? Or how long will it take? You see what I mean? The more people you talk to and ask them, would you buy this? And if not, who do you know who would buy this? And if not, what could I change about it so that you would buy it? Maybe the person will say, well, if you could tell me that I could work with you and in, in a month I would feel better and specifically I would maybe have a half hour more energy a day, then yeah, I would probably buy your service. You see what I mean? You need to talk to more people. One of the questions, um, and thank you Barbara for asking it, is how do I, how do I language what I offer so that the, I'm doing it authentically and that people want it? And the answer is not something you... It's not just about journaling and reflecting and thinking about it. It's about talking to more people. You've got to talk to prospective clients. And you've got to talk to prospective partners. What I mean by partners is other people who have audiences, bloggers, podcasters, people with an email newsletter, people with Facebook groups, whatever. Talk to audiences. Talk, talk to 
prospective clients one to one and talk to prospective uh, partners one to one, asking them, "Hey, um, I'm I'd be so grateful just for 15 minutes of your time asking about whether my offer is a good one. Um, w would you buy it, or would someone you know buy it, or if not, what should I change about it so that they would buy it?" Okay, and my goodness, it's already at the 30 minute mark. Um, let me actually ask you, I, I know that I'm consistently coming, I have so much content to share with you that I'm consistently coming to the end of the time. Do you mind, do you want me to keep these podcast episodes to 30 minutes or would you rather me share for 40 or 45 minutes? And actually do let me know. Uh, I know some of you are, there are hundreds of you who are listening to this who don't even watch the video. So those who are listening, uh, please go to ourhighestwork.com and let me know. Would you rather me keep it at 30 minutes or go to 40 or 45 minutes sometimes, maybe all the time? It seems like I na more naturally do that. Um, I have a whole list of, of, of sort of things to make the offer stronger, and I'm wondering if I should, um, and thank you, I see Becky is here live with me and Keith and Larry as well. Thank you so much. Uh, so... I have to actually 20 ways to make an offer stronger. I actually think this would be better as a separate episode. So I am going to end the episode for today. I think there's probably plenty of things to already think about and implement this time. Let me know. Let me know what you found most helpful about what I shared today. And um, before I end the episode, I also want to um, thank a new iTunes review. It was, it was from Jack Johnson. Thank you, Jack. And he wrote, Our Highest Work has quickly become one of my favorite podcasts. It really hits the sweet spot for me as a spiritually minded entrepreneur. I enjoy George's take on the topics he addresses, but he's also very clear that his is not the only approach, absolutely. And he, he's very open to other paths, as is the community as a whole. Highly recommend. So thank you, Jack, for that iTunes podcast review. If you also wish to review this podcast, you can go to ourhighestwork.com slash review. So um, with that, I want to welcome you to also join our community, which is where the, con the conversation continues and where you can ask your questions and get help from others in this community. You can go to ourhighestwork.com, click on community, and I welcome you to join us there. And I look forward to having your presence there. So until the next episode, be well and keep your thoughts and your heart positive.